really glad to be able to be with you here, even though it's early morning in Canada and afternoon for you. I'd like to give a special welcome to the people who were on the last Magic Egypt trip who have come to Glastonbury for the conference. So delighted to be here, and thanks very much, Hugh. Okay, so um, here we go. Pyramid Code is a five-part documentary series that's aired in 26 countries on TV, and there's several more deals on the table. And it's also available on Netflix, so let's just move straight into the presentation. Next. Okay, so what I want to do here is give a bit of a context for what I'm going to be talking about in terms of matriarchal cultures. Uh, most of you may be familiar with the procession of the equinoxes cycle, and it, we go through several ages. Uh, the last age that we've been in lines up with the Mayan calendar, but the important part to notice is that there are ascending and descending ages, and we're at the darkest part of the Iron Age. And in my opinion, we're just about to turn the corner with 2012 to go back into the ascending cycle, and that's what's going to be fueling us with this new energy that could change the face of how our society uh, has gone. And uh, so you see the age of Aquarius and then the age of dogmatic beliefs, and we're in the Kali Yuga, which is the, uh, the Iron Age, the descending age. But what I'd like to point out is the dynastic period of Egypt exactly parallels the Mayan calendar from 3113 BC through to 2012. And so there's something really significant about this period. I also think about it as the patriarchal period, 5,000 years of uh, the denial of the sacred feminine, and I think it's gotten us into a lot of trouble. But if we keep going back, next please, through time, again from the right to the left, um, we see that most of the cultures that preceded the dynastic period of Egypt and the Mayan calendar were actually matriarchal cultures. And so one of the problems with looking at ancient Egypt is there's going to be the newer, the medium, and then the very old. And anything other than the dynastic period was matriarchal. And one more slide. And taking us through to cave drawings and... You know, the Magdalenian culture, the first alphabet, all the way through. And in this period of time, we've had several world floods, and that has prevented us from being able to see all of the evidence from the distant past, but it's nonetheless there. And it's at conferences like this that people each bring their own puzzle piece, and everybody's figuring out their own little bit, and this is the way that we can really put many of the pieces together. Next. So Egyptian history is actually quite limited in terms of where the story came from, and what we've been told isn't necessarily the whole picture. So if you can imagine a few people running around in science just, you know, getting going and archaeology becoming a science in 1910 and a lot of explorers, it's, it's entirely reasonable that we could have been given a story about Egypt that's only part of the story. And indeed, it's coming from a patriarchal perspective. Next. And so there's one, yeah, okay. This is um, a Temple of Isis, an old picture. You can see it's just um, a scan of a picture in a book. But there's a Temple of Isis that's located to the left of the Sphinx and down below, and now it's all cemented over. And so there's a road, and right in front of the um, Sphinx Temple, there's been a whole lot of new cement put on, and so a lot of the roots that we would have been able to perhaps locate and find before have become inaccessible. And so there's a lot of evidence that has been uh, erased, including inside the Great Pyramid and, and other sites. And so we really have to be piecing things together um, by getting hunches from our intuition, perhaps past life memories, and then grounding things in the field in reality. So. Um, a lot of the evidence has been erased. Next. So one of the most significant things that uh, I cover in the Pyramid Code is the idea of the old riverbed shifting. And so when we're looking at the Giza Plateau and the network of passageways underneath the plateau, um, they used to fill with water. And so this picture is from the 1920s. And so even as recently as, as then, uh, when the Nile would flood, the water would come quite close to the Great Pyramid that you see in the background. And so in recent times, in the last year and a half, the water has started trickling back up at the foot of the Sphinx. 
And they put all these sandbags there so that it, the water won't go close to the sound and light show seats. Um, but nevertheless, the old riverbed is still in place. So that shifts our perspective also on what we've been told about Egypt next. What I'm going to do now is show you some details of the newly cleaned ceiling at the Temple of Dendera, which is very close to Nag Hammadi, where they found ancient Gnostic texts. Um, the, the ceiling is about 40 feet high, and prior to this, I'll show you in one of the upcoming slides how it used to look. Uh, the ceiling was nearly black, and um, if you look at the, I hope you can see the details on this picture, you'll see uh, a lot of female beings with stars above their head, and uh, archetypal uh, half-animal, half-human uh, beings, snakes, and standing snakes and a cobra on top of a sphinx, which is really a personification of a person. And it begs the question, what were the ancients actually showing us here? And anytime you see a snake, it's about immortality. If we're going to boil down what the ancients were really showing us, there were two things. They were looking at biology and how we got here, how we incarnated, and then cosmology what happened when we departed. And so, to me, the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera is, is, a, is, a, is the entire cosmology the, of, of the ancients, and um, it's been sitting there hidden under a thick layer of black soot and mold. Next. And here you see the blackened section of just one part, and that's all we had before. Now you see a baboon to the right of it, Baboons in ancient history uh, measure the passage of time. Um, apparently, they pee every 12 hours, and that's and the ancients weren't shy about animal functions. Uh, above it, you'll see uh, the zodiac, Sagittarius, and the crab on the right. And so, in various places, and, and the ceiling is quite large, um, you'll see the cosmology. And here comes next the little icon. That's all we got to see before, and I find it interesting that they left one little blank spot there. So if it's 40 feet high and all we had was the outlines, it, it's very, very difficult to photograph at best. Um, and these pictures were taken with an 18 megapixel camera, which allows me to be um, reading a little bit more detail. Next. On the far left-hand side, you see Isis is standing upside down with a band of stars and wings. And then you see a procession of solar boats on the bottom and the Eye of Horus, and then a cast of characters and reptilian beings. Uh, lots of snake energy on top and uh, lion-headed beings, snakes, snakes carrying offerings. And the seraphim, the highest level of angels, were known to be reptilian. And so we've heard a lot about the Anunnaki, and, and, and the reptilian beings out there. And it perhaps they weren't malevolent in times past. It could be that they were bringing some teachings. And it certainly seems that the ancient Egyptians weren't shy about, um, about this sort of energy. And so the solar boat has these um, lotus flowers on the end. But if we were to look at diagrams from quantum physics of wormholes, what we, it's a similar pattern. And so, to me, this is expressing um, a journey into other dimensional realms. And every time we see the Eye of Horus, it's sacred geometry, which is the pathway between the dimensions. But up on the top left corner, next please, um, I'm just going to blow up a feature in the corner, which is particularly interesting. We have the personification of a man. He's got four wings, two uh, cobra heads each with a feather, an ankh, which is a symbol of life in one hand, and a sail in the other. Now, deciphering this, to me, is the four quadrants of the 2,600-year uh, cycle, roughly 6,500 each, and this is depicting passage through time, looking back into the ascending ages from before, and forward into, sorry, forward into the ascending ages, back into the descending ages, but the cycle keeps going around. And so um, this is the symbol. So the snake always.